Hello and welcome back to the channel, it's Mark from PowerSonic and Apprentice One to One. Today I wanted to talk about my install and how that works when we go into island mode. At both a consumer and an electrician kind of level, we're going to speak about the benefits and the way this stuff works in terms of keeping your generation running and also delve into how the earthing system and other such things play out. Before I do that, I want to show you around my install with exactly what we've got. So we'll start here in this main little control cupboard and then we'll build out from there. So it's a good job my wife is currently out because we're pulling all the cupboards and everything apart in the house. But you can see we've got a plastic water pipe down there. I shared this on videos before. Um, so we don't have any services coming into my house that are metallic. We are really unusual, I would say, for most of the UK, but there's none of that on my install. So out in the garden, just by the bins, you can see I've got my meter box. That's gas and electric. Gas is plastic as well. Uh, there's a switch fuse in the meter cabinet. There's a video on all of this already if you want to watch it. And apologies about the wind, it's really bad today. Um, but we've got a steel wire or a submain that runs off to what was the mechanical changeover switch that's now just connected straight through. And then we've got the cable coming out to the shed, one going to the EV charge point, which you can see on the wall down there. There is also an earth rod over on this side that we've popped in after cat scanning. We were a bit worried about that. That's why we've not done it right near these bits here. It's more towards this end. And um, yeah, that's in there as a reference for the um, house, if you like. And we'll jump and talk about that in a bit as well. Over on my shed, there's a video on this too. We've got eight panels up there. I think they're Jinko 425s. They could be Trina 415s. We've got a generator on here. This is a Solis. Again, apologies about the wind. 3 point, I think it's 3.3 .3 kilowatts. It's currently doing a couple of kilowatts. Um, and that's got one string up there of eight panels. And we're monitoring what this is pumping out now as well. It's surprisingly good because um, we've not had a summer season on that. That was put in sort of towards early autumn, I would say. Um, but doing its thing, we've got an earth rod down here. And again, my earth farm video I did went into all of that if you want to go and see that so there's one of those in there and that's tied in and in parallel back to the gateway so there's no disconnection of that anymore we'll speak about that in a bit just behind here uh, discreetly or maybe not as discreetly as i thought there is some other earth rods conjure disc and bar in the ground and they tie into the earthing within the shed and then run back to the house as well as a as a bigger earth farm the panels up there Again, they're quite a gentle pitch, but they are pumping out some power when the sun up there starts tracking around into the right position, which is super helpful for us um, trying to go off grid because it's another source of generation. Up on the house, we've got these nine Trina 415s on the south elevation. You can see they're all in sunshine right now. And on the west side here, we've got another three of them. So there's 12 on the house, eight on the shed, giving us a total of 20 and roughly speaking, eight to nine kilowatts of generation. However, you're never going to see that peak because of the different um, angles they're pointing. So you've got, sorry, directions. You've got the south and the west. And equally, this array is very flat, so it's never going to really peak itself to its full potential because of that. It's not angled at the right pitch. But you can see at the minute, while we've got the sun up there, it is absolutely flying in its generation in March. It's fantastic to see. Um, and that is what we've actually got out here. We'll jump inside and talk about everything else. So Bruno's playing very close attention to what's going on. Hey, Bruno. He's a good boy. Yes. Good boy, Bruno. Um, so he's paying attention. I'm going to have a wander off back to the cupboard of doom. Jack's on his Xbox upstairs. Router's over here, so we can see that's powered on. And he might be about to get a little bit upset with us because I am planning on swinging into island mode. So we may hear lots of shouting and kicking off when we do so. But as I said at the minute, that earth farm down at the shed, and again, if you watch the video I did on that, there is... Um, an RA on one electrode of around 40 ohms. The whole system with everything connected together is 1.4 ohms. So it's really, really low. Um, so yeah, that is now working as a reference, if you like, not a reference, a support electrode for the PME earthing arrangement. We should be putting those in place now on our installs. We've seen that in the regulations. So it's, it's working a different purpose in the grid tide mode to an island mode. So those rods are now sat as a support to the PME if there is a pen fault. In essence, they're providing that, that support mechanism to it. Whether that's a good or a bad thing is up for debate, but that's something that is suggested to us in the regulations with no real defined value on it as far as I know, and that is what all that's doing. However, when I swing this over into island mode, they start performing a different job. They become the... 
the reference point for the new generator set. So when you do your energy supply, you always have an earth at the source um, for the systems to reference to. And that's what those start to do in that case. Now in, in my install, it's a bit different because we've got a source here in the AIO, which has an inverter. There's one here in this inverter as well. And there's one out on the solace at the shed. So which one becomes the primary source in all of that, if I was taking a best guess, and I posed the question on social media, and, and Neil Bridgman said the same as what I thought, that it would be this, because that's the kind of thing that keeps all of these others running. Um, and how they play nice amongst all of this um, is the magic of everything, is my uh, basic um, understanding and interpretation of it at a technical level. And I really want to focus in on you know, how the system operates as a whole and how the earthing system works as a whole on those two modes. So if I drop into island mode, it will keep the PV running for both of the inverters and it will start taking power out of the battery to sustain my house loads. Now, because we've got such a lot of generation at four kilowatts, it'll still be charging the battery up because my house loads at the minute are tiny. They're probably five, 600 watts. That's just Jack on his Xbox. Everyone else is out and I'm not consuming any power. So we'd still be filling that battery up um, and we would then be on a TNS, earthing arrangement, according to industry guidance in the EESS book, in the regs, uh, and all those other places, that is what it dictates our supply is, and that is because of the earth electrode forming the reference point to that system. It's not TT, it's not TNCS, um, and it's not IT, and we'll speak about why that's important a bit later on in this video. So that's the, that's the suggestion, but I have some queries on that that I've been talking about on social media and in the real world with Michael Peace from the IET of late who is an absolute powerhouse of knowledge the guy is off the scale in terms of engineering and you know the stuff he knows is way beyond anything that I know I'm just sharing this from the real world and some of the things we've seen in the hope that that might help those people um, and in talking about it in posts and in videos that I get an opportunity to learn there's never a lose in that equation you know if I'm wrong People can help me understand why and learn. And if I'm right and I've got a point of view that's helpful because I've noticed something that is a problem, other people can take that and get value from it. There's no argument in all of this. It is just a learning exercise for me. But anyway, we're going to swing the grid off. The route is still on. That's the critical aspect to all of this. So the grid's gone off. Grid meter goes off. We've done it mechanically. It would do it electronically. Route has stayed on. We're still on blue. Now is what happens is the Solax system is really sensitive. So it's seen that drop out. It's now waiting to see the supply come back and it will start checking and fire itself back up. You can see it's doing that now. It takes a little bit of time. It's just one of the quirks of how these systems seem to work. However, the all-in-one has kicked in super fast, so fast that the, the DC power pack that's feeding the router hasn't noticed and that power's stayed on. And we're now in island mode. So now the house loads are taking their power from the battery, the solid system's still running. I can't run out there fast enough to show you and then get back here in time for this 30 seconds. But it is, I've done these experiments lots. You'll have to take my word for it on that. Uh, and we're now in island mode. So now this earth connection from the DNO is still connected in that earth bar, that's still connected. However, the line and neutral are disconnected. So we have no physical connection back into the grid for our line and neutral. Our fault currents are all internal to our installation and we move over to a TNS system. However, my query and question on all of that is that if the DNO's earth is still connected, how can we be fully independent from it? What purpose is that forming in its current setup? And some of the answers I've had from, again, a super knowledgeable person, um, an expert of industry, a legend, Darren Cranis at the ECA, um, as I said, it's kind of there just because it is there, it's serving no real purpose um, in itself. It just remains physically connected and is not used. And he's right. In our own install, as far as I understand, that is correct. However, we've seen an issue out on one of our installs that I'm going to talk about in a minute. I'll spin you around to do it. just want to show you that the PV is starting to fire up. All of the optimizers are kicking back in and that's climbing. So that's doing its thing. I'm going to go back into grid mode and it'll do its reverse. It takes about 20 seconds for the gateway to resync itself back to what's going on, and then it'll drop that over, and we can um, go back into a connected state, which is fantastic. So that's how that works at a consumer level. I'm gonna spin you around now, and we'll speak about some of the other observations and concerns I have with all of this. So it's done it, now back in grid mode. 
forgot to show you the router stayed on as well. Jack's not shouting. Okay, so on one of our installs of late, I had a customer get in contact with me complaining because their EV charger was cycling on and off over and over. Unfortunately, at the time I was in the office and I jumped out to go and look at that um, and see if I could offer a solution. Um, I was worried we'd made a mistake, first and foremost, and I didn't want that to present a problem um, on one of our customer installs. So within a couple of hours, I was out there um, started doing some investigating and yeah I, I noticed that the customer was off grid they weren't running from the grid they hadn't noticed themselves um, and through measuring voltages and stuff it all seemed to be okay there's an earth electrode down with the EVSE charge point which forms part of the earthing arrangement when they are in island mode I just happened to put a clamp on that um, I guess mindset of diverted neutral currents and everything else I'm, I'm going on about that here and there now and then so I just did it, and there was 30 amps sat on there. And at the time, I was like, oh Christ, what have we done in the install? Because the neighbours are all on, there's no network outage um, as such. You know, you don't instantly start to think in the right way when you are out on faults. So I'm not going to pretend I instantly knew what was going on. There was some further thought process. But when you're at that stage, turn the customer's supply off, take them out of island mode, shut everything down. And that 30 amps was still there, and that's when those dots had started to join up that we could have something going on out in the grid. So rang the DNO up, tried to explain the circumstance and situation, and they were really good. They had someone out there within a couple of hours. Amazon delivery, dogs went bananas. Apologies about that. Um, I think I was just talking about the DNO coming out, and um, yeah, they, they were really good. They started digging up the street straight away, because when they disconnected my earth rod, I didn't want to do it because there was 30 amps on there, and you know I wasn't entirely sure what was coming from and to where. Um, but then three neighbouring properties all lost their supply when that was connected. So obviously there's a fault in the cable out in the street. It starts using an alternative earth path. This customer again had a an RA of under 10 ohms. You know, we're always trying to get under 50 on ours with islanding systems and in general if we can. Um, and I'll explain why about that in a minute as well. They disconnected it, those houses went off and they instantly started investigating. Result was they dug up the street, found a fault in an old cable joint on a CNE cable that they had to fix and aren't always back rosy and working. But that got me thinking that when we're calling these systems TNS, was that customer's earthing arrangement in that circumstance TNS? Was it TNCS? Was it TT? You know, when you've got a fault state out in the grid, all bets are off as to which direction electrons are going to start flowing in, in my experience. And, you know, pen faults are really rare. It's improbable, it's rare, but it's not impossible. There's about four or 500 recorded cases a year, and it's enough of a thing for the regs to kind of change themselves with EVSE charge points in particular to start mandating this pen fault unicorn protection or using earth electrodes. So it is a thing that's out there. And for me, when I'm looking at these systems now, having had that experience myself, and the earth is still in there, kind of connected, and you know it's not really forming any purpose or practical use, why not disconnect it? Um, you know, my install is really rare here in my house, talking about this one now. There's no metal services buried in the ground. The only metal work is the stuff I've chucked in the garden out there, um, messing about with these experiments and such. So it is really, really rare to have that. But if I was to disconnect that PME earth when I go into island mode, I know I would be truly TNS, which is the source and primary generator setting all of that is still a bit of a head mangle. But, you know, I would be. We would have no physical connection there. No fault current could enter my install from external. Um, and any fault current in my install would be on a TNS basis based on that setup, loosely speaking. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't make sense. And the EESS guidance suggests we keep that DNO earth connection uh, and that's why I've been thinking along those lines. How I used to have it set up with a manual changeover switch, I used to switch out the DNO's PME earth and just run off my electrodes with the equipment I had. Um, and I make these mistakes in terminology all the time. I'll often call these TT, even hot tubs with earth electrodes on them on a TNS earthing arrangement. I'll call them TT because that's just the default when you bang a rod in the ground, it's TT in it, that's the language we use when that's not really always accurate to the, the circumstance at play. So I'm not perfect. I get those things wrong all of the time. Um, so yeah, it's just to put that out there for, for discussion and debate. And I've done that on the socials already. I think I said that earlier on in this video. And you share those things as a learning exercise for me and the hope that there might be 
some discussion that builds from that that's helpful to others as well. And when you see people like Darren and Neil and um, other people getting involved and then Michael Peace coming to talk to me and stuff, you know, I learn such a lot from that. It's it's invaluable. I'm privileged, really. I'm really lucky to have that in my network. And, uh, yeah, I value it a lot. And I want to talk a bit about the manufacturers in all of this as well because we have some really good guidance. I don't want to be seeing that I'm knocking the guidance that's out there, the PV, EV book, all the guidance notes, the, the battery storage one as well. They're brilliant. There's some way smarter people than me put those things into fruition. However, what manufacturers are saying, separate to that, um, puts installers in a really tricky spot. I consider us as in the murky waters of the real world between those two places, definitely in the PV and battery storage game uh, and more widely as well. One of the really irritating things I find is that we'll be told, oh no, they're the regulations. If you end up in a court of law and you haven't done this, this and this, because we sold you in all of this stuff, you should be doing it. Um, and then when it's spun around the other way that there's inaccuracies in it and there's all these courage endings and whatever else, oh, it's just guidance. You know, that's frustrating. You know, there's got to be accountability both ways around in that for me. You can't say it one way and have it the other. So that's um, a slight frustration with some of the regs and guidance. But it is what it is. It's a beast in itself, isn't it? These things take years to agree and put together. That's the other thing. As a simplistic electrician where I'm saying, well, let's just start disconnecting all the DNOs earth. It's not that easy, is it? There's things to do with G99, the quality of supply arrangements, all of those other bits and pieces that need to fall into place. And to get a change in the regs, there's all the committees and stuff that are involved. And the evolution of all the manufacturers in and around all this, it's just impossible, isn't it? So I get it at that level. It's something they can't really change very quickly anyway. Um, however, maybe some stuff that install or installers are talking about is helpful education for each other. So that's what this video is about. Anyway, going back to the manufacturers, if you inquire to them, you should be able to ask them, what's the ZE on my source supply of equipment? Because they have become the primary source. If we inquire to the DNOs, they have to tell us. We ask them what the value is for the ZE is. On a domestic TNCS system, we know they're going to come back with 0 0.35, and we know it's never going to be that, but that is what they will tell us by inquiry. We should be able to make the same inquiry to the equipment manufacturers. However, it's like you're speaking foreign, they don't know what you're on about. They're brilliant at telling us all the stuff the equipment can do. You know, your maximum string voltages, the maximum power they will handle, their um, discharge cycles, lifespan, all the rest of that great stuff. And the clever technology in there that makes this work with the energy markets, which is all amazing. They're doing incredible work on all that for both consumers and us as electricians. But you start asking them at a, a technical level some of the stuff we need to know to satisfy BS7671, and they ain't got a clue. You ask them about the earthing arrangement of their equipment, and they'll start, start saying it's, well, it's IT. That's what they're suggesting. And, and we know that doesn't work in terms of BS7671 when we've got multiple circuits and sockets running entirely off-grid around our, our houses. Um, they'll say you don't need a neutral earth bond relay. Um, so where, where do you sit in that? As installers and consumers, it's, it's really difficult. Um, the only one I'm aware of that actually, I think, satisfies all the boxes is the Tesla Powerwall. I think that is one of the few that installers can be confident fitting, knowing that you know we have met the requirement of the regs. The, the rest of it is just gray and mucky and murky. Um, and manufacturers can tell us this stuff and say, well, it doesn't matter because you know we've tested it, it works, it's fine, it's safe. It's IT earth and you don't need a neutral earth bond relay. And this is more than one manufacturer saying this. There's no one in particular. There's a few. Um, the reliability of their apps and stuff. There is so much that's that's not quite where it should be. And it probably is all to do with the pace and the innovation and, and things. Um, but that needs looking at. And hopefully industry can challenge that. Because what can we do as installers, really? We can moan about it. We can ask the technical outlines for both our awarding bodies, whoever we may choose. We can ask MCS. We can raise questions through through the rag and stuff, but that thing, you know, it, it takes a long time. And we're installing this day to day. We want to do safe, compliant installs for our customers that are going to be right for the long term. And that's why I think this should be looked at. In the here and now, these are a tiny percentage of installs. It's super rare that it's ever going to be a problem because not many people are running off grid. Not many people have this stuff, but 10 years from now, it's going to be everywhere. And this is our opportunity to get it set up in a way that's going to be right for the long term. And that's something I think we should try and progress a bit quicker than maybe we are out in industry um, as a viewpoint I guess so yeah it, it is what it is on that front isn't it I think I've covered everything that I wanted to say and set out how my install works you know I wanted to show the power of the system that when you are off grid your PV keeps running your battery keeps filling up it's brilliant on a day like today it's what, like late March now we're kicking out 
it's just gone over five kilowatt and that's separate to the shed so there's plenty of power being pumped out by my system that battery is now full and i can see it's um starting to export so that's fantastic um yeah oh just to speak about the testing as well i did want to mention that so when i'm testing my um ra there's a video on my channel of me doing that i might have mentioned it already just off one electrode um and when I do that with ZE and IRA, the results are fairly consistent, what you'd expect. But even when I'm in island mode, I'm getting similar values and it, it's weird trying to understand why. So that's a, a whole other level of engineering beyond what I can figure out. But it is an observation with the equipment I'm using. Same with the fault currents I'm measuring in island mode. They're way higher than you would expect. And they're genuine test results. And I know when you look in the guidance documents, it says you can't rely on those test methods because of x y and z which is fine and i know when you take an mft close to a primary source on the grid you know you're not going to get accurate results because they're just not sensitive enough when you are really close because of the fault currents involved with this it didn't make sense because they're not big fault currents maybe it's something to do with the electronics and such and the different generator sets and but even when i'm doing them one at a time it's the same sort of thing so it's weird it's weird um it's all new and like I said, we want to do it right. So that's why I'm sharing this video. Feedback from other installers, feedback from people who are way cleverer than me um, in the hope it might help me learn and maybe help one or two other people improve their knowledge as well. And perhaps some of the manufacturers start putting their values of fault current and ZE in the box with the instructions um, and helping us a bit more with complying with BS7671. Because we've already had this with EV charge points, haven't we? And those electronic RCDs. And getting that admission out of manufacturers took ages. And you only have to watch um, Sotter's recent video of the My Energy Zappy and what he's recently been told to see how that plays out as installers and how we are trek further down the line. Um, so, yeah, if you are out there in industry with a position of power, we'd very much appreciate you looking at this and trying to help us. Other than that, please do get involved in the comments. Feedback, your views and thoughts. If you've got any suggestions and ideas in and around all this, if I'm way off on topic, let me know. It'd be brilliant to hear back from as many other people as possible. Thank you for watching. I hope Jack's shouting hasn't put people off too much. He's in the middle of an epic Call of Duty or Fortnite game or whatever. I forgot to mention about the earth rods and a couple of other things I'm going to cover off now. So I still do some bits and pieces with the DNA I used to of the years gone by as well. And the rods they're fitting on the PME side to support the system are generally around 20 ohms. They allow one ohm or so for going up the pole if we're going to be really pedantic on it. But that's kind of where those numbers come from, quite how they formed and brought into play. Not 100%, but that is what they do at that level. Um, so when we're fitting these electrodes at a consumer side and we're suggesting they're a reference or support or whatever we want to call them for the PME, getting those as low as possible makes sense. Um, if they are going to be effective in carrying those fault currents and stuff. You know, when you're doing that, you need to start looking at your cable sizes and the potential for all of the currents coming into your install that might end up in your earthing arrangement. And all of that gets really messy. But, you know, that's my view on that issue. And the other thing with the earthing is, you know, I said my street is really rare with the plastic service and stuff. Most of the streets, you're going to find lots of metallic services in the street. There might be electrodes in different people's gardens if they've got sheds and garages, external buildings, hot tubs, all the rest of it. There could be metal that's just in there because it has been for years, old metal drains and things as well. And that results in all these earthing systems overlapping and interacting in the mass of earth anyway. So even if you was to switch out the, the DNO's earth in your install, you're going to have all those bonds still connected because you still need those and all of the um, underground stuff overlapping and working its way into your system as well. So it's really difficult um, in lots of urban areas especially to get that separation uh, and in my opinion to ever truly be your own isolated little island because in fault conditions stuff goes a bit crazy with the way electrons work and what they're attracted to and what they're not and where they've come from so that's the short story on all of that um, the other issue with it all is and this comes back to a little bit with your outdoor consumer units with EV charge points as well when we're in island mode it's generally due to a network fault there's been some issue that's been detected disconnected from it gone into island mode now pen faults are rare but at the time they're going to happen it's most likely when the network is in a fault state so if we've got an ability to detect that and remove or reduce that risk as far as possible because obviously the bonds could still be carrying those kind of issues into your install anyway 
but you can eliminate it as far as possible. We've got an opportunity to do that over the next 10 years. Why not take that opportunity and do it? And the same way with these EV charge points and outdoor consumer units, and there's all the arguments over um, pollution degree and the stuff that I've brought forward into the discussion with all of that. But the way that these apps work in, in notifying that a car stopped charging and the default behaviour is to go to a consumer unit and start resetting devices, I do that here. My board is inside the potential zone. I'm quite safe if there was a pen fault or as safe as you can be in doing so. But if your metal fuse box is outside with all of those protective devices in and you go out there and start operating them when there could be a pen fault because the charge has detected an issue and stopped charging, there's a potential for that not to play out very nice for the person flicking in those switches, especially when the covered door is metal as well, and that's the first thing they're going to hold on to. So it's one of those where we can integrate the ability of technology and how this stuff works to try and reduce a potential of risk without really any extra expense or effort. It seems like a sensible move. Just wanted to close the video on that. Thank you for watching.